Great lease practices make your rental property business run smoother and more profitably. And they don't cost anything, so you've got no excuse not to up your game today with Tip Tuesday. I'm Jennifer Rulins, landlord, educator, advocate, and broker of One Focus Property Management. Today's video is all about leases, best practices, and my best advice. I'll tell you though, this is going to be a two-parter this week and next week because there's so much good content. Let's get started. Written or verbal, I hear this all the time. So in Pennsylvania, it is legal to make up to a two-year residential lease verbally. However, I don't advise it. I don't advise any um, contractual agreements be verbal. They should all be written. And on top of being written, all changes and amendments to that agreement should be documented and signed by all parties. Month-to-month -month leases or annual leases. Rental property owners will tell you all the time, I like to write a month-to-month -month lease because I think it makes it easier to deal with the tenant if they become a problem. I think that's really poor advice. I think you should instead focus on being able to write and enforce a quality lease with a qualified tenant. That's gonna go far smoother for you and far more profitably than simply a month-to-month -month lease. We have to remember, attracting tenants isn't free. Leasing isn't free. It's very costly, at least in terms of your time. And if you're doing any sort of advertising and application processing, there's probably some costs included as well. So if you're putting in all that money to attract a qualified tenant, shouldn't we get some um, lease performance out of that? Shouldn't we get at least a year's worth of tenancy? I tend to think so. So who are these people on the lease? There's people called leaseholders, there's people called occupants, and there's people called co-signers. What do each of these mean and what do I need to do about it? Well, <laughs> leaseholder is a person who's over 18 who has all the responsibility of the lease. So they have all the responsibility to comply with it. They also get the benefit of a possessory right to occupy that property. So if I, I'm over 18, go and rent a property alone, just me and my household, there's gonna be one leaseholder on that lease and it's me. Now, if I have somebody else in my household who's not qualified to be a leaseholder, two major ways this happens. One, they're a child, they're under 18 years old, so that legally they can't execute a contract or be held responsible to it. That would be an occupant. Also, a person who's not able to execute contracts, so maybe somebody with um, a cognitive disability that isn't able to um, execute on their own contracts could also be an occupant. So occupants are generally listed below the leaseholders and are defined as people who are entitled to occupy the property but don't have obligations to pay rent or to comply with the terms. All of those responsibilities belong to the leaseholders and it's their job to make sure that their occupants are not breaking any terms of the lease. The third type of person who can appear on a lease is a co-signer. A co-signer is a leaseholder. They're a person who has all the responsibilities of the lease and they have none of the benefits. They are not entitled to occupy that property or enjoy any of the possessory right to occupy. So you can have up to three different kinds of people on the lease. So that first example where I live by myself, let's say instead I have a child. I have a 10 year old child in my household. On that lease, I would be the leaseholder and my child would be an occupant. Now, if I didn't meet the application standards of the landlord I was applying with, they may require a co-signer of me. So I might ask one of my parents to co-sign on my lease. So in that case, me, I would be the leaseholder, my child would be the occupant, and my parent would be the co-signer. I have all the rights and responsibilities of the lease, I also get to occupy it. The co-signer has all the rights and all the responsibilities and none of the rights, and the occupant has all of the rights and none of the responsibilities. So you can see how those are different things. Now, every single person who occupies that property needs to be on that lease regardless of whether they're going to actively participate in paying the rent. So at least every person who's over 18 needs to be a leaseholder. That is very important to protect your interests. And anybody who's not over 18 or able to sign that lease needs to be listed as an occupant. Okay, so we know how to write the lease, but who signs it and who gets copies? Okay, so the people who need to sign the lease are the landlord, and any leaseholders. So any of those adults over 18 who have the um, responsibilities on the lease, and so do co-signers. Co-signers need to sign. 
Occupants do not need to sign the lease. An important thing you need to make sure to do is make sure all those signatures appear on the lease prior to issuing keys. So what you should not do is allow the lease to be partially executed and give possession of the unit to the tenant. We need to make sure all those signatures are on there before possession is handed over. And that can be tough because when people are moving, they often get separated and somebody's not there present with them. So make sure to handle that well before move-in day. You wanna make sure all the tenants get a copy of the lease once it's signed. So everybody in the transaction needs to have a copy of that lease once it's executed. It's very important that you do not sign the lease before the tenant. So some, pra some people will practice signing the lease and sending it to the tenant, asking them to sign it and then return it. It's very important that the tenant not have a lease only partially executed by you. It gives them a lot of options whether or not they decide to execute it and when. The lease is the governing document with your tenant. So anything that comes up in your relationship really should be governed by that contract. Now, you need to keep a hold of it. You need to treat that lease like the asset that it is. It really goes along with the property. The property doesn't have a whole lot of value as an income producing property without a valid and an intact lease. So I meet a lot of rental property owners who don't have leases anymore. They've lost them or they've been mishandled. These leases need to be kept safely and securely, um, preferably in a safe or a safe deposit box, but it's so easy now to scan things and keep them in digital repositories that are safe and will never be compromised. I strongly consider uh, ask you to consider scanning your leases and keep them digitally as well as on paper. That way you have a nice backup. I have so much more to share on leases. I'm gonna make a part two and post it next week, but you don't have to worry about that. If you subscribe, it'll come right to you once it's posted.